Welcome to I Finally Get It. This week we have Bill Lacasco with Fusillet Surveying and Mapping. Joining us in studio today, as always, Dustin Webb, our producer. I'm your host, Jeff Martin. Let's get it. We talked about it with my business partner about lessons learned, and uh, you know, it's we've we've learned some things along the way, but I think. We've been blessed in that we both started out at Fence Maker, yeah, uh, yeah. A, a wonderful firm. Probably still be there if I didn't have the opportunity to own my own business. But taught us a lot. You know, it's a good company. Obviously, been in business a long time. Successful company. Uh, my business partner Ryan Fuselay, he worked there as a division leader for for a good time. So he he kind of learned and he started that division on his own. He was an engineer. Yeah, he's an engineer at first. He kind of had a passion for the technology. In our, in our industry, surveying and engineering, he started looking into laser scanning and some of these other higher technologies that are used, and he got really interested in it and wanted to bring it to Festmaker and introduce it and uh, and get kind of that service line going, Festmaker. So he, he took it, ran with it, obviously, you know, uh, Festmaker backed him and uh, started, that, started a brand new division there. So he had experience, so to speak, starting a business within the you know the the umbrella of fence maker so he had always done surveying on the side so he got his degree in engineering civil engineering from from UL uh, USL at the time but got his degree in civil engineering but during the summers he'd he'd work as a land surveyor or work for his father in law as a surveyor developed a, a, a really really a, a passion for that and so kind of did that on the side just to make make a little extra money because he because he liked it well he got. He got so good at it, uh, he got he started getting more calls, more calls, more calls, and got to the point where he just couldn't really manage that side business and and yeah. and yeah. run run things uh, at fence maker, run that division at fence maker. So he thought, well, uh, this was back in 2017, 2016. He said, if I'm ever going to do it, I'm going to start my <laughs> own business. Now's yeah. the time. He went off on his own. Well, I was kind of his right hand man and helped helped him a lot with with running that operation over there. He told me probably within a year I'm going to give you a call, Bill, because you know. I'd like you to come. I'm going to offer you maybe a little bit of the business, and or you know, bring you on as a as a as a partner, and uh, you know, just let me know if you're interested. I'll probably give you a call in about a year. Well, two months later, he called me, <laughs> and I was not prepared, as you probably know, Jeff. I'm not a risk taker. I, sure. I was very comfortable with fence maker. I enjoyed my job, so I really had to pray over that. Really discern about that. Much respect for Ryan. He was he was a wonderful boss, and obviously, you know, started that division, developed a lot of respect for him there. Trusted him. As yeah, as a business minded person, thing, yeah. uh, a guy who can make major decisions, make things happen. Uh, so I, I really had to pray over that. It took it took a few months to kind of discern, and I just felt I felt the call to go, and I went, and it's been great. And yeah, uh, yeah. that was that was 2018. Ryan had already kind of got things up and running a bit. It was just him him and a two man survey crew at that at that point in time. But he was smart about it to the point where uh, when I came aboard, we kind of put our minds together and we, we decided we need to start, I guess, siphoning out buckets. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so revenue, you know, so, and those buckets couldn't be touched only for the sole purpose of what they were created for. So for example, you know, general expenses, payroll, uh, savings. So we would have these buckets set aside and certain portions of our revenue would go into those buckets and they wouldn't be touched. You know, unless an equipment, a piece of equipment went down, General expenses, that's where that would come from. Absolutely. Sounds like Profit First. Have you ever read that book? No, I haven't. Yeah, it sounds like a Profit First um, take, but that's an incredibly smart way to go. You know, the big picture, and I guess the point I'm trying to make is uh, because we had that experience working with Fence to Make or working under some very knowledgeable people as far as how to run a business, we brought those lessons learned that they had already imparted to us into our business in starting the, in starting our business. So we really have not been hit with any major oopsies and yeah, trying yeah, to learn, yeah, learn yeah. from those, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we've been kind of blessed in, in that respect. It's about building relationships too, you know? So uh, we've been blessed with having relationships from our time at Fence to Maker. Yep, no doubt. Right, about it. No and obviously about clients it. that we, who enjoyed working for us. We didn't. We, we never attempted to pull any clients. They're a major, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. service provider for major industries. We're just, you know, we serve the community in small boundary work and yeah, sure. that type of stuff. So it's different umbrellas of work, right? So, but anyway, so we had established those relationships, um, and uh, so that's we've been blessed by that in starting our own business. People have reached out to us, and so you probably seen the show, and I reach over when they have a light bulb moment, and, and there are actually two in there. One, relationships matter, right? Mm -hmm. you, you have the relationships, you continue building relationships, and that's so important for anybody to hear. But but you guys, you waited 
to go off on your own after you had the experience that you needed to operate a business like this. Right. And I'm going to tell you so many people, it's, it's ready, fire, aim. And they just, they take off because they want to own their own business. So they want to be their own boss. But you guys did the work, you put in your time, you gained the experience and then you went out. You, th- you think that that has been a big deal for you guys? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and you know, we've, we've steadily been growing. You know, we, we like, like I said, Ryan uh, started out in 2017. I joined him in February, 2018, but you know, with, with him and a two man survey crew Yeah, and, yeah. and now, now we're up to, you know, 21 employees. 21. So, yeah. yeah so, so we're, great. we're, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've been steadily growing. And, uh, in this day and age, young people come out of college, um, you know, and this, it's not their fault. Society has taught them that, Hey, you know, it's, you come out of college, you're going to be making a ton of money and, or, you know, people who are maybe have a, have, have a passion for something. will try to try to jump right into it without gaining that, that experience exactly because right. there's this instant gratification that people expect nowadays. You yeah, know? sure. Um, so, I mean, if there's any wisdom to impart, I, I would think would would be to find a company that likes what you like or a variation thereof, and then you know try to try to obviously get employment by them and learn from them and get the experience needed, and then get a, a foundation of finances set set aside. Yeah, yeah, and, correct, correct. Yeah, and I mean it's it's common sense, but it's not common practice. <laughs> when, when you when you're passionate, when you just have have this intense passion about something, sometimes. You, know, you can't see the forest of the trees, that, right? That's you know, right. So, that's right. Uh, you know, you want to maybe step back and just try to gain that experience. Great advice. Yeah. Re- it really is great advice. So, so I want to go back because you are the one person I I know no other person that graduated from the Merchant Marine Academy. <laughs> Not many people do. <laughs> it's one of the coolest things yeah. out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me about your experience. So, you grew up in Ohio, right? Farm, farm town, one stoplight town. Yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you had the opportunity to go to the Merchant Marine Academy. Yeah. You know, I, I did well in high school. Uh, I, I graduated co valedictorian. you know, so, you know, obviously you got to have, you got to have a decent grades to get into a, a federal military academy. You have to be nominated by a congressman yep, and to go yep. through all that. I had no intention of really entering the military, but their football coach started, started calling me, wanted me to come play for him. <laughs> And then, of course, you start looking, and, and they tell you all the, you know, they got a sales pitch down. Yeah, yeah. You know, sure, our graduates sure. make with within the top five percent of salaries and such and such. You know, and they, plus you get to travel the world, and that was true. Yeah, you definitely have to yeah. get to do that. Huh? Yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the things that you know, my, my stories of my days at the academy. Uh, I probably wouldn't be married to Erica if I didn't have those stories to to, to yeah, pique yeah, yeah, inter- yeah, exactly. her interest initially when I, because that she thought that was so amazing. So that was something I had not expected was going to be my, my path. You know, I was thinking going to a public university, you know, but yeah, sure, sure. Uh, went and played some football for a division three academy, uh, you know, and it's, it's the, obviously there's five federal academies, yeah. military academies, and that's the one that nobody's ever, Not nobody many ever people think of. about it, but it's a great opportunity. Yeah. So what'd you do after you, did you have to put in five years after that? Eight years, yeah. but, it, but it was in the Naval Reserve. So, okay. Yeah. And, and you really weren't obligated to do a weekend a month. You could, you know, uh, but it was inactive Naval Reserve. So your obligation was two weeks a year, really. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got I got mean, it. that was a minimal obligation and I, I enjoyed those two weeks. That was, Heck yeah. you know, time away and seeing different places. I, mean, I, th- I think I did uh, San Diego Naval Air Station three times, uh, you know, went to San Francisco once for two weeks, you know, so that it was kind of a minimal obligation. And then as far as your work life, you could enter into, because I, I graduated with, with marine engineering systems degree, you could really enter into, enter into any engineering field. You didn't have to work for the correct, military, or, correct. you know. Uh, so it, it was, it was flexible, you know, nothing obviously against the other military academies. I mean, those are, those are great, great institutions and obviously, you know, um, kudos to all those guys that go into the military active and all that stuff afterwards. Sure. Uh, but if there's one military academy, if you want to have the flexibility afterwards, yeah, after, after, uh, the yeah, Merchant Marine yeah, Academy you got it. really, really kind of gives you that. So I enjoyed that. Spent 300 days out, out at sea, sailing the Far East, Hong Kong, Japan, Okinawa, That's amazing. you know, yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun seeing those places. You said that you, you that impressed Erica, right? Yeah. And so you're from Ohio, and you ended up here in Lafayette, which is a different world. Yeah. So how did y'all meet over there? Was she in optometry school or no? We met before she went to optometry school. Okay. I, I I got a job down here right out of college oh, and, and, okay. and, and school offshore company. Went up to the academy. 
to interview a bunch of us. And they hired, I think, three or four of us. Mm -hmm. uh, came down here with one of my my classmates, and I think he left within two weeks. Did, did, did not did, enjoy did the offshore <laughs> uh, drilling experience on those, on those rigs. But, I, you know, I did that for a year. And okay. kind of, I put in time just to see, as I test the waters, and realized it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Yeah, sure. I missed my, my family in Ohio, so I moved back home, mm -hmm. got a job there. But I came down the next summer to visit all the friends because – the people down here is not a cliche term, this is the Southern hospitality term. The yeah, people right. down here are amazing. And the friends I'd made felt like I'd known them all my life. So I made a commitment to come down here in the next summer and vacation, visit them. And I did. And uh, it's a glorious story. I met her downtown at the sidebar. <laughs> <laughs> That's outstanding. Yeah. yeah she's but, but, a wonderful lady. Too. But it was open mic night. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is that, yeah. were you singing or was she? No, no. <laughs> she could have. She's got a great voice. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. And look, you've made a family here. Mm -hmm. I know both kids and they're beautiful, wonderful kids. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's get back to opening up the company. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that I find fascinating are, are the people that have steady jobs. You even admitted, you know, you, you're not a big risk taker. Mm -hmm. They had an opportunity. He wanted you to come on. You guys were, were doing this thing together. What was it besides trusting him that that got you interested into starting this own this company. I mean, he he just started it, right? But what what well, was intriguing about it? it? I, you know, it was because of his leadership at Fencemaker that that I and that I developed kind of uh, you know a passion or uh, maybe just a likeness for the for the for the industry. You yeah, know, I'm I'm a I'm a math guy. I love the trig and the geometry of it. I love you know land surveying. Just kind of falls in my wheelhouse as far as how I think. So that was one thing I knew. I knew I needed to have a have a passion or or at least you know a, a desire to pursue this. You know, and I did. But you know, it's about trust. For me, it was just about trust. I trusted him, and uh, honestly, I, I trusted that it was God's call for me to to go into this. Yeah. So there were a lot of just discernment, and prayer. You know, I just you know, like I said, it took a couple months, and 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 also Erica supported it one hundred percent. That's huge because she trusted Ryan, and she trusted that it was, it was that's kind of where my path was going. And I've always had a thought of what it would be like. You know, yeah, I think I would like to be a part of maybe part ownership or owner of it, but I never thought I'd get to that point. I always thought I'd be a lifetime employee of a company just because Correct. I'm not a risk taker. Yeah. It, it would have to be the right variables for me to take that leap of faith. And yeah. it was. Mm -hmm. And But probably what, what tilted the scales to me wanting to do it was the fact that Erica supported it yep. wholeheartedly. Yep. She was she was on board. What's been the best thing uh, about the, the move? The flexibility. Yeah. We all work from home. We have, it's not, we're not a brick and mortar shop. Yeah. Our, our, yeah. our field crews work, work from home. They work out of their trucks. I've been able to kind of be there for my kids, be there for Erica. Uh, although I will say, you know, the first couple of years trying to build this business, I was working a lot, but the fact that I was there, I was home, I was present. Yeah. Uh, Cause I've, I've always been one that to work a lot of hours, you know, at times unnecessarily with me being at home it, it allowed Erica, you know, allowed me to be present to them more. Yeah, that's huge. So that's been the best part. Yeah. It's just being being there for them, and and now that we've grown to a point where I've been able to hire hire a really good project manager who's handling handling a lot of my day to day stuff, and you know I'm I'm able to be there more now. What's uh, your role now? I know you're chief uh, operating officer, chief but, operating but officer. what does your day look like? I handle a lot of proposals and client client interactions now. Okay, uh, good. Whereas my my project manager he takes the project from award all the way through execution to the end. I mean I'm still involved in a bit in the, in the the end process as far as reviewing the deliverables before they go out and, you know, coordinating with Ryan because he's, he's a licensee. He has to stamp, got it, got stamp it. him. So, uh, and, uh, but that's, that's my next step is to uh, get my license. So as, as an engineer, as a surveyor, surveyor, mm -hmm. very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. PLS. Mm -hmm. All right. How long is that going to take? <laughs> Uh, with my experience, it's it's hard to say right now. I got to get with lapels in, in Baton Rouge. Uh, they're the people that uh, kind of look over how how land surveying and civil engineering is practiced here in Louisiana. I, I need to send them kind of my resume and all that I've done and and see what they tell me I need to do. I'm probably gonna have to take a couple courses, you know, but because yeah, yeah. I can do it, yeah. Yeah, it's good. So that's that's kind of the next next step. Honest to goodness, I, I did a little bit of research, and I know you guys do oil and gas. You do residential. You do commercial, but what is involved in both surveying and mapping? And I want to hear more about the laser stuff because that's pretty fascinating. Well, I mean, surveying and mapping, if you're a licensed firm, obviously you can map. Um, but mapping is the capturing of the data and putting it onto, you know, uh, 
paper form and getting it or PDF. Uh, now everything's electronic, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, so, so obviously there, there's several aspects of surveying. There, there's your standard boundary survey or as simple as someone calling up saying, Hey, I want to put a fence line up. I need to, I need my corners located. Then we go out there and got it. find their corners and stake them for them. And now they, now they can tell the fence guy where to put the fence all the way to, you know, hundred acre surveys that are wooded and we got to use aerial LIDAR because we've got a, a fleet of drones that, that we, that we have in our arsenal to deploy. Uh, we don't, own, cool. we don't own a LIDAR, an aerial LIDAR system. They're very, very expensive uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> still, but we, you know, we just don't do enough of that work to justify the expense yet. Right. Right. Um, but uh, you know, we, we know how to do it. In fact, that's one of the things Ryan kind of initiated over there at, at Van technology with a lot of help from a lot of good good people he developed that that service line over there at fence so he knows all about the technology and had a, had a passion for it so obviously the, these these lidar systems is you know they they send out uh, lasers and it, it reflects off the ground it's 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 light light detection and reflection so it's amazing yeah and it reflects off the ground and so you use lidar in areas where it's heavily wooded because it can penetrate that vegetation but we also can use a technology called photogrammetry. So it's just, it's a camera system that takes a bunch of still shots as, as it's flying. And then you know, our software stitches those, those, all those pictures together and develops a mosaic of the ground. Yeah. And that is more used in kind of just bare earth situations with, with, with little to no vegetation because it, it can't penetrate the yeah. vegetation, get down to yeah. ground, ground surface. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like, if you think about it, you're kind of just laying a blanket over the terrain. That That's, that's what it sees. You know, that is so neat. So, and, and it's these elevation too. Yeah. So you can pull elevations off That's that. Amazing. Stuff. Yeah. I mean, back in, back in the old days, you know, you, you had to send a crew out there and they had to walk. Usually you'd get a, what we call a grid of, of topographic shots or ground elevations and they'd have to walk through these trees and, you know, through these highly vegetated areas and just take a shot every so often. Yeah, exactly. And take days to do hundreds of acres. You know, they would take days. Now you can go out and fly a hundred acre site in half a day and come back with the data. Yeah. All through drones and stuff. Yeah, through aerial lidar and, and mapping and, and uh, photogrammetry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's not cool at all. <laughs> no, it's, it's cool. I mean, it's just like anything else. As technology gets better and better, uh, our services can can advance and and cost efficiency goes up. And yep. you know, so. so what's next for Fusilay? You just going to keep doing what you're doing and growing and and get better. You know, we're planning for the future. We're trying to we're trying to build our business. We're you know to to the point where maybe we can get into some oil and gas, heavier oil and gas services. There's hydrographic. We're not quite there yet. Bigger client stuff that we could be doing, but we just don't have the resources right now because we're sure, still a small sure. firm. Um, so that's that's just kind of steady growing. But we're you know the economy hasn't hasn't been the best, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, that's kind of put maybe a little damper on our plans, but you know, inflation, and everything has kind of affected us, but you know, we're, we're doing well, we're blessed and we're staying busy. We, you know, we've got our crews working. So we're just kind of, kind of getting through this little rough patch with the economy and just see, see what see how we come out. So do you, you feel like you could start another business after you've experienced this? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, after, after you gain this experience, yeah, I, I could. It's the experience. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I'd be more willing to, uh, you know, because I've I've done it now. Uh, the the scary, the, the unfamiliarity and the scariness of the whole concept is not really there anymore. But you have to. I don't know what I do. You know, I mean, I, yeah, I, I know I you love, love what you do. Though, I right? love what I do, and that's the thing. Yeah. Is you know, you you know, some people go into business because they're they're passionate about something. You know, some people go into business because they just happen to fall into a career path and gain a bunch of experience, and and then they meet the right person that allows them to maybe want to conquer uh, the venture of going into business. I think mine is kind of a combination. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I graduated with an engineering degree. If you had told me. 20 some years ago when I graduated that I'd be in land surveying. I'd be like, what's that? <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. And, and now, and now here I am. It's just, it's just, uh, I think everybody's got their path. Um, so, you know, I, and I kind of developed a passion, not knowing that this is where my path was going to go. I developed a passion for surveying and it helps to, to have had the, the experience with the right person, to, yeah. the right mentor to help you and teach you along the way. You know, you have to be mentored by someone who has a deep passion for it as well. Otherwise, if it's just a job for them and they're not passionate about it, then you're not going to so if you do have a passion for something right out of college, if you're young, you have a passion for something, obviously, you know, your, your relationships with others with that same passion will, will help help build build you in, into an opportunity that maybe you can own your business to. Yeah, I love what you said, though. Everybody has their own path. And the truth is, if you had asked you that when you were coming out of the academy, 
you would have said, what's that, right? But now looking back, doesn't it all make sense? It just it kind of pieced it all together and, mm-hmm. and here you are. And that's the thing for me is as I've gotten maybe a little deeper in my faith, I've realized how, how there's been a, been a pulse and a little finger on yeah. on, on my path. Um, yeah. You know, uh, uh, someone kind of in the background guiding. So. Yeah, no doubt about it. Who would you say has been your biggest inspiration? Because look, you're really disciplined. You're pretty conservative in, in, in your approaches, right? Mm-hmm. Who instilled that? Was it your family? So my dad was a blue collar guy, worked for Ford for 44 years, very loyal, hard, hard worker. So he's, as far as uh, a dad working full time, coming home, dog tired from his job, yeah. working on, you know, on the rail yards and loading vehicles in the, in the, in two feet of snow and, you know, working under these, under these trains, hooking cars. I mean, he just, he worked hard to the point now when he walks, he's kind of hunched over. He just put his body through a bunch of, you know, physical, and then he would come home every day, cut the grass, yeah. you know, help us do stuff. I mean, he, he just, you know, so he's, he's always kind of been, been my inspiration as far as work ethic and commitment, and loyalty. My mom is very practical great mother. So I, mean, I guess it's just fact is, you know, it's, it's, it might be a little cliche to say, but my parents have been a major inspiration yeah, in my upbringing absolutely. and, and kind of teaching me who, who, who I should be as a parent and as, as a, a person who's employed, who's work, who's, you know, as a worker, um, you know, just take pride in my work. Yeah. Uh, I love it. My business partner as a mentor, he's inspired me, uh, yeah. uh in many ways throughout, you know, my, my not only my time working for fence maker as, as his, uh, you know, as his right hand man, but also through this business, uh, building this business. So you come in contact with a lot of people. How do you try to leave people different and better just because they met you? I think it's just the old mantra, you know, you, you, you treat people how you want to be treated with respect and dignity. You don't want somebody walking away from you thinking that, uh, you didn't really care for that conversation. You didn't really care for their presence or, you know, you were bored or you were, you know, you, you thought you had better things to do or, you, you know, you pushed them away because, you know, throughout high school, throughout college, yeah, I, I've, and, you know, that's something that I learned from, from my mom is that, you know, you, you always want to treat people as you would want to be treated. Yeah. Right. Yep. So um, I, I try to make people feel like their concern, the point they're trying to make, the reason we're in this discussion, the reason that they're, they've come to me is the most important reason to me. Is, is the most important thing to me at that moment. It's not being disingenuous. It's not being fake. It's not trying to, but you know, um, we all have our own concerns and, uh, you know, are tied up in our, in our heads at times when yeah, people are right. talking to us and, and they can see it, they can sense it. Thanks for tuning in to I Finally Get It. To learn more about Bill and what he's up to, visit our show notes. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you're an entrepreneur and you have a light bulb moment that would help another entrepreneur, please reach out to me at jeff at ifinallygetit.com.